So now we're going to look at a very, very specific problem. I will tell you the domain. I will tell you the initial conditions. I will tell you the boundary conditions. And then we'll take this problem from the very beginning to the very end. And, there, and even though it's a very, very specific problem, and once again, probably the simplest problem of this kind, there is still a lot, a lot to learn about it, about things and about actually nature and how math relates to nature. So let's, so here's the problem. We're now in 1D. So our, our domain is a segment from 0 to 1. Many physicists would say it's not the simplest possible domain. They would say the simplest possible domain is an infinite line from minus infinity to plus infinity. Or a ray which goes to infinity. And those would actually be very, very different domains. With something very valuable to say, and actually contrasting those with this one is very interesting. So that's one thing. So that's the domain. Not the simplest, perhaps. The nice thing about the infinite domains is that it allows you to to a degree, ignore boundary conditions. Here, I want boundary conditions to be front and center. So I chose a segment from 0 to 1. I chose a specific coordinate system, Cartesian coordinates. It's the variable x. It goes from 0 to 1. So our function u is now a function of t and x. The Laplacian became just the second derivative with respect to x. The initial condition will be some function, maybe it'll, well, it'll go right through 1D. <laughs> that looks like this. How about, think of it as sine pi x. Maybe it's a good function. It, would actually, it will actually lead to a little bit of confusion, but we can deal with it. Sine pi x. And now my boundary conditions, which are typically a function of time, I will say are 0. Zero. So on the boundaries, it starts out at zero and constantly stays zero. So you can think of it as a guitar string in, in honey. It won't vibrate. It'll just decay to its equilibrium. But let's see what we find. There's more to say about this. If this is a temperature distribution, it will just slowly get down to zero. OK. Here's what we figured out. Here's what any solution looks like. It's some function of x that satisfies this equation of which we will now concentrate. Before, we had to save it for later. We had a complicated domain. Who knows how to approach it? But now we have a relatively simple domain, that, so we will actually solve it. OK? So it's that function times the exponential decay all added together in a linear combination with some coefficients. So all of this we got from the general case. Now we have a specific case of 1D, specific domain, specific conditions. Let's go ahead and solve this problem. So now we must address this problem. We have the Laplacian of f, which in one dimension is simply the second derivative of f with respect to x equals, remember the most important thing, we don't know what omega is. If omega was given, then you would say that you know exactly what you're looking at. It's just an ODE that you've solved before. Give me my initial conditions, I'm done. Now it's a lot more interesting. You don't know what omega is. And this will be the essence of how the domain dictates frequencies and the heart of the theory of what musical instruments sound like, and what the natural frequencies are, and all of those things, of a bridge, of a pitchfork, of, any, of the camera, of the building, of a drum. This is the heart of it. OK, but this is an ODE. The second derivative equals minus a positive number times the function itself. We know what that looks like. Now, we've got to be able to say something about omega. Something, what's, 
what does the omega need to be? Now let's remember boundary conditions. We need to have zero on the left, zero on the right. And recall that this is not a matter of fitting A and B. It is not a matter of fitting A and B. This is an eigenvalue type of equation. By analogy with AX equals lambda X, whatever function satisfies this equation, any multiple of that function should also satisfy that equation. It's not a matter of A and B. I'm trying to think very quickly, uh, what's the fundamental difference from what we considered before? It's not quite coming to me in this succinct way. I'll think of it. But this says more about omega. This says more about omega. Omega needs to be such that we can nail zero here, and we can nail zero here. And actually, so I think this deserves to be written, because that's very important. U of zero equals U of one, and they're both zero. The initial, the boundary conditions are so important, they need to be on the board as well. And that's not just at, um, at any time for all t. Okay. I think that's probably why, it's, why we're more focused on omega here than a and b. Because it's not a matter of just finding one. It's a matter of satisfying them continuously. I'm still not 100% sure what I'm trying to say. But here's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that let's look at the sign. It needs to be such a sign that it just lands right back at zero. So if omega equals one, this won't work because it'll land back down at pi. It will be zero again at pi. We're good at zero, but we will land back at zero at pi. So omega cannot be one. Omega cannot be two. Omega could be pi. So if omega is pi, do you see how by analogy with linear algebra, the eigenvalues come first? Now the eigenvalue, let me write it down here. When I say eigenvalue, I mean om minus omega squared. That's the eigenvalue, right? That's right here is the eigenvalue. So, but if we find omega, we find minus omega squared. So omega can be pi. Can omega be anything else? Pi over two? I don't think so, but two pi. You just went the wrong way. Any multiple of pi. So what we observe here is quantization of the spectrum. Two new words. So spectrum is the collection of the eigenvalues. So in this case, we will say that the spectrum of the Laplace operator on a unit segment with zero boundary conditions is n pi. They're discrete numbers. Saying minus n pi doesn't help because it's just taking minus the sign. So it's just n pi. So yes, there are infinitely many eigenvalues. So the spectrum, the collection of the eigenvalues, has an infinite number of elements in it. But at least it's not a continuum, which is what we would have had. You can see it right here. If we were considering the infinite line, you don't have a boundary, any omega would work because you don't have to worry about the boundary conditions. But as soon as you have to worry about the boundary conditions at a finite distance, the spectrum becomes quantized. And we have to throw, and we have to throw out the cosine because there's no way we can make it, we can make it fit the boundary conditions. It will, it'll, no matter what, it'll start at one or a. So, now we can be a little bit more specific about what u is. It'll be a sum of still infinitely many terms, but at least now it's a discrete sum. It's a nice series. 
If it was not a discrete sum, we would start writing integrals instead of, instead of sums. But it's a sum of C, I can now say C sub n. Still haven't satisfied the initial conditions. I'm guaranteed that I've satisfied the boundary conditions. But I have still not satisfied the initial conditions. Well, actually, in this case, it's entirely obvious what you do. How do I satisfy the initial conditions in general? Well, I have my C's to play with. This will be very interesting in just a moment. We'll talk about the initial conditions. But because I, the initial condition that I chose here was sine pi x, it's very clear that you just take C1 equal to 1, and the rest are all zeros. Does that make sense? Yeah. Let me just write it down, and then in a second we'll have a more general discussion. I wouldn't use the term particular solution because that's an ODE term. So it's, this, it's the solution that matches the initial conditions and the boundary conditions and, of course, the function, the operator itself. So you might ask a question. And a very important question is what if, well, you chose very convenient initial condition. What if the initial condition was like this? I don't know. There's a candle here, and then someone dropped a piece of ice, and there you go. What if the initial condition was like this? Then what do you do? How do you match the initial condition? Well, let's take a very close look at it, because there was someone who saw this for the first time, and it started a debate that lasted for decades and led to all sorts of things, from Hilbert spaces to set theory, the question that arises naturally from this discussion. So let's watch this question arise. Let's take this general form and plug in t equals 0, because that's how you match initial conditions. You take your quote unquote general solution, you plug in t equals 0, and then whatever degrees of freedom you use to match the initial conditions. Let's see what happens here. u at time 0 at x equals, so the sum remains from n equals 1 to infinity. The sum remains. We, have, we still have c sub n. So that's what u is at the initial moment. And it needs to match the initial condition. What's a good letter for the initial condition? Capital U. So let me call this squiggly function capital U of x. And let me write it in the opposite order. It's worth it. So the recipe, the recipe is completely obvious. Completely obvious. It just says here is what here is the solution will look like. So to match the initial condition, simply, simply represent whatever the initial conditions are as a linear combination of these signs, of these discrete signs. So there, so there, so there you go. So there you do that. Do that. And then once and you, then do once that, you do that, hopefully that will determine this coefficient uniquely. uniquely. Just plug them back into this formula and you've got your unique solution. Unique solution. And so the and obvious so the question obvious that arose that arose is, is number one, number one. I don't know what number one what can you do it and how you do it and how those are number one and two. Number one and two. I'm not sure what the order is. Can you do it for any function? For any function. So that was, so that was, that was, that was a matter of debate matter for, of decades. for decades. And one of the most fascinating most reads fascinating I ever had was a paper by Riemann on, on the history of this. This, this, is, this is called a Fourier series. series. It is not a simple question. Can any function uh, be represented as a sum of a Fourier series? If so, how? And if the answer is typically yes, then how well? well we're going to start discussing this very question next time. But that's what this problem has come down to.
And just to connect it back to my uh, ode to the second derivative, what, the way this question has arose kind of gives you the linear algebra significance to sines and cosines because they appeared as the eigenvalues of the Laplace operator. That's why they're there. That's why the second derivative is responsible for life, because it's responsible for sines and cosines. That's why sines and cosines are so important. That's why we think of uh, everything in terms of sines and cosines. You tune your radio to a particular frequency, well, there is a sign there. Because you solve basically Laplace's equation in the antenna, and its eigenvalues are the frequencies that you can tune the antenna to. I want to make one final note, is that what would change? So how eigenvalues depend on shape. So my, my PhD thesis was on that topic. Uh, this is just one, this is the most, the simplest example of that kind of problem. If this was length L, let, let, let's just follow through where it would go. Then we would be still here, but then we real, would realize that each one of these needs to be divided by L, right? So that when you plug in L for X, you end up at a multiple of pi. So then the eigenvalues are n pi divided by L. And this is your evidence right there for the way the guitar string works. Because it tells you that the frequency depends on the length. And help me find, I just found a contradiction. Uh, help me resolve it with the camera rolling. So I know that if when you uh, press the guitar halfway down, when you make its length half of what it must be, oh no, perfect, it's nothing. To, yeah, you double the frequency. That's exactly what you're doing here. So the corresponding eigenvalue gets quadrupled, but it's not the eigenvalue, it's the frequency that matters. And so you see it right here, the dependency on frequency, on how the domain dictates what the eigenvalues are. And one thing, and frequencies, and one thing that's always unmistakable and works in all dimensions is that if you shrink the domain by a factor of two, frequencies will go up by a factor of two. A drum that's twice as small will be an octave above, twice the frequency. One other thing that I'll mention, the menorah problem. So, and you see it here. So if the initial condition was like this, tremendous variations, once again, I want to point out that these high frequencies, according to this, will die down much more quickly. You see the exponent is much greater. So after a short moment of time, this will look like this. And after an even shorter moment, and after another short period of time, it will look like this. So the quick oscillations go away quickly, and the slow oscillations go away more slowly. So all of these things we're learning. But I think the most important of all the things we learned today is how the domain determines the natural frequencies of the body. That's all.